Well, if you take your Bible and look with me in 1 Samuel chapter 13, my text today is from verse 1 down to verse 14. And I want to speak with you about the greatest sin. Another title might be the gravest sin. If I were to ask you, well, what is the greatest sin before God? I know there are different ones that have their thoughts of sin being categorized, and typically adultery is right up there at the top, of course, stealing, murder, all of these things. And they think in terms of physical sins. And yet, the greatest sin before a holy God that we're going to see here in the life of Saul is endeavoring to come to him in another way than what he has ordained. So it has to do with how men worship God. See, we live in a religious generation and they're all about, like Paul said, going about to establish their own righteousness, but they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, the justice of God. That is that which God declares to be his justice and that apart from that justice being satisfied, none can hope to enter into his presence. Well, that righteousness is none other than his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the sin that many ignore. And we see this example here in the life of Saul. Now remember, my text here is in 1 Samuel chapter 13, but you remember that the children of Israel became dissatisfied with Samuel. And they begin to wonder about God giving them a king like all the other nations. We saw that last time in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And God gave them what they requested. Doesn't mean you can twist God's arm and get him to act according to what you desire, but this was in God's purpose all along knowing them to be an evil generation, that when they cried out and asked for another king, God granted them that king, but with warning that that king, just like them, would lead them astray. And if we had the time and took the time in 1 Samuel chapter 12, the one just before the one that is my text today, you'll see where Samuel gathers the people. And in verse one, he says, I have hearkened unto your voice in all that you said unto me and have made a king over you. He's speaking here as God's prophet. You wanted a king? Then here is the king according to your desires. It's like so many today, they rejoice whenever they pray for things or lust after things, and God grants them what they desire. I would say even down to signs and miracles, people say, well, God must be in it because look what happened. So-and-so got healed, I got healed. Well, we read in the New Testament, it says that God uses Satan to manifest his power through signs and miracles but it says at the same time, they causes those people to believe a lie because they've not desired the truth. Their heart is not set upon God nor upon his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as you read 1 Samuel chapter 12, Samuel is warning them that in all that God has given them and manifest his blessings unto them, yet they still desired another king. And toward the end of chapter 12 of 1 Samuel, he says there in verse 20, Samuel said unto the people, fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. When we look back even on our own lives and we consider how many times out of an evil heart we sought things of the Lord. And for a while, we lived according to what the Lord gave us. 
And yet there came a time when by his spirit of grace, he caused our hearts to turn to the Lord in truth. We're no better than these that Samuel was dealing with. We have the same nature in our heart. And yet now that our heart has been turned, we're not to go back. It says in verse 21, turn ye not aside for then should ye go after vain things, empty things. But here it is again. What is it that displeases God the most? I know sin is displeasing God, but if it were all summed up, what would it be? It would be going after vain things, empty things that are not to the honor and glory of God nor his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, which cannot profit nor deliver for they are vain. People worship today in the manner that they do and they have a God of their imagination and they pursue that God. That's what an idol is. It's an idea that they form of God. It's not according to scripture but they live out their lives pursuing this God and desiring to receive from him all that they ask. And yet it's not to the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ unless or until it pleases God through his word to reveal him in their hearts. But here's the good news here in verse 22 of 1 Samuel 12. For the Lord will not forsake who? His people, among all these in Israel, there was that people of God, elect according to his grace, ones for whom the Lord Jesus Christ would come and pay the sin debt. An example is Samuel himself. You can cite Joshua. You can cite even Jonathan, Saul's son. Even though he was of the house of Saul, yet he found mercy. For Christ's sake, Mephibosheth that we're going to study next time. These are ones that amongst this evil nation, the Lord had sanctified, set apart in his electing grace and taught of Christ. You say, well, Christ hadn't even come yet, but in the sacrifices that they offered, it depicted the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ that was in them caused them to worship looking to him, not putting even confidence in the physical sacrifices of bulls and goats and lambs, but in what or who those sacrifices represented. And that's a blessed truth that the Lord will not forsake his people for his name's sake. Paul himself declared that. He was of the tribe of Israel, the son of Benjamin, but he said there, in Romans chapter 11, that God will not forsake the people that he foreknew. He's not talking about just anybody and everybody, but again, that people chosen of the Father and given to the Son. Because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. There Samuel's directing his word directly to that people that God had purposed should be saved. So in light, in spite of the rebellion and the rejection, yet the Lord was still working and he would have his way. And you can see the burden that Samuel had, much as we have for friends and loved ones that are yet in darkness. Verse 23, First Samuel 12. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Now there came a time when the Lord told Samuel not to pray anymore, particularly for Saul, that he had given him over to his own reprobate mind. But here it was obvious that there were still those that through the prayers of Samuel, remember he represents Christ here as God's prophet and priest and king, interceding on behalf of those that the father had given to his son. And so he says, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord and ceasing to pray for you, for you who? You who are his people, verse 22. Context is everything. It's like our Lord's high priestly prayer in John 17. He thanked the Father that the Father had given him authority over all flesh 
but to give eternal life unto as many as the Father had given him. He said, I pray not for the world, but for those that thou hast given me out of the world. They are thine. And so Samuel here is speaking to these, not knowing even himself. Our Lord knew those that were his, but here Samuel as a man is praying, believing that God would do his work of grace in the heart of those that God would cause to hear. It's like when I preach, I don't know who is the Lord's and who isn't, but I declare Christ unto those that the Lord brings, knowing full well that the Lord will not forsake his people, his elect ones, those that Christ has redeemed and God has justified by his death at the cross. That's what gives me encouragement every time I stand up to preach. I don't believe that somehow everybody's going to believe. No, only those believe that God gives that faith to believe, those eyes to see and look to Christ. How is it that you came to Christ if you are his? Well, you know it wasn't you. It was the Spirit of God taking this word, opening your eyes, giving you ears to hear, and you ran to Christ. It's like those ran to the city of refuge where there was that high priest. You ran to the Lord Jesus Christ and there you abide. But so long as the Lord gave Samuel breath, he says, I will teach you the good and the right way. <laughs> well, you could preach an entire message just on that statement right there. What is the good and what is the right way? Well, there's none good but God. As Christ said, so why do you call me good master? He said that to the lawyer. It wasn't that he was denying that he was God, but here was one that denied that he was God. And so the Lord said, well, if you call me good master, what's the difference between calling me good and calling me God? Because that's who God is. The good and the right way Christ is that way. And if God is going to show any goodness towards sinners, it's going to be in this way. Here in the Old Testament, the sacrifices that were offered typified that way. Go all the way back to the garden. When Adam and Eve sinned, God slew those innocent animals and took those skins and clothed them right from the beginning, from the fall. It was demonstrated the good and right way. It wasn't going to be through fig leaves, but through that which looked forward to the Lord Jesus Christ coming and earning and establishing that righteousness necessary for God to be satisfied and then laid down his life, paid the sin debt, putting away the sin of his people forever. That's the good and right way. And so the greatest sin or the gravest sin is to look another way, to try to come in another way. And that's where we enter now here in 1 Samuel chapter 13, my text. Let me read verses 1 to 14 because it's important for us to understand the context here. It says, now Saul reigned one year after he had been established as their king after one year and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin and the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had in abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal, and the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. 
Look at these numbers, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward from Beth Haven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait where the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. <laughs> so much for having a king. No true safety or security in this king. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal and all the people followed him trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal and the people were scattered from him. You can read where back in 1 Samuel chapter 10, Samuel had instructed Saul to go to Gilgal, verse eight, thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal. Behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and sacrifices and peace offerings. Seven days thou shalt tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. Seven days. But here it says that he tarried seven days, just like he said he would. In verse eight, chapter 13, according to the set time that Samuel had appointed, but Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. You begin to see here what is the greatest sin? Attempting to come in another way to God and what he's appointed. God's appointed prophet, God's appointed priest was Samuel. He's a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's Saul being in the flesh of a natural mind, determined to take matters in his own hands. And it came to pass, verse 10, as soon as he had made an end of offering and burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And I believe it was before those seven days were completely over. It says in verse eight, he tarried seven days, but here comes Samuel, exactly as the Lord had appointed. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, what hast thou done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me and that Thou camest not within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered themselves together in Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal and I have not made supplication on the Lord. And as he said, I forced myself therefore and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. So here you are. This is the one sin for which Saul was forever rejected. He said, now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. We know that in the history that pertained to David, but prophetically it pertained to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is that man after God's own heart. God's heart set upon him. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So if we go back here toward the beginning of these verses here, we see in verses one and two, just how Saul chose himself for his own security and safety. And I dare say even in pride, thought that a limited number was all he needed in order to get done what he wanted to do. Because it says there after he had chosen 3,000 men, 
and this would have been for continual military service and protection. 2,000 were with him and 1,000 with Jonathan, his son. The rest, it says there, he sent home. So in his mind, he was at peace. It's like so many in their natural minds that think that God is with them. And they're not aware of the urgency or the danger even of having been left to themselves. They're looking externally and seeing how God seemingly is blessing with these temporal blessings. Here he is, putting power as a king and now ruling over Israel and now having all of these troops at his command. And even to the point now of determining to go out and take on the enemy. It says there in verse three that Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines. The Philistines were the continual enemy of the people of Israel. Part of those original nations that were in Canaan that were never completely driven out. And there must have been some sort of agreement or understanding between Israel and the Philistines that they would live at peace with one another, at least be a, a truce. But here we find that in verse three, Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land saying, let the Hebrews hear. Here when Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines in Geba, that Saul blew the trumpet and declared a victory. One battle and for that a victory. And so all Israel heard say in verse four that Saul had smit the garrison and that Israel also was hid in abomination with the Philistines. And people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. Again, Saul doing all of these things for his own name's sake and not considering even the mind or the will of the Lord in the matter. So here we see the reprisal. The Philistines in verse five gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. More in number than what Saul had set apart for keeping himself secure and safe. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. And it says people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. He poked them in the eye. And now somehow expected that all would be well. But here then he sends out messengers to call the people and to prepare them for war. And again, this is typical of works religion, that the people are have to do the fighting. The people have to do the battle. And it's up to you. All the way down through here, there's no mention here of Saul even seeking the Lord, but going on his own. And verse six, the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait. That's what God does. It says, for the people were distressed. There is no peace. There's no comfort or safety in taking matters into your own hands and then thinking that somehow you're gonna be okay. That's what's so devastating and evil about the works of men's hands. It can only end in condemnation, just as we see here. And having no sure refuge. You see, they no longer now have Samuel that they can look to because Samuel has said, here's your king. And so all they could do, it says there, that they hid themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. Such is the end of those who do not have Christ as the true refuge. There's no place to run and there's no place to hide. And even when they did follow Saul in verse seven, it says that all the people followed him trembling and in fear, 
That's all that can come out of going your own way and trying to work out your life as you see fit and thinking that somehow God's going to bless it. Well, when he brings you into those straits, just like he did with these children of Israel, this is a trouble of their own making as it is any time that we determine by our will or by our way or our works to do anything, it ends in nothing but condemnation. Oh, may the Lord grant us ever, never to seek from the Lord anything that would be for our own glory or our own doing or our own works or our own will. It's a condemnation if the Lord ever gives you over to your own way, your own will, your own works. Just like there in the wilderness, they asked for meat and the Lord gave them meat, but sent leanness to their souls. So what we're seeing here is the consequence, not only of the children of Israel seeking a king of their own, just like the other nations, but also the grave sin, the greatest sin of this king in taking matters into his own hands. Now he sets himself forth and he's attempting now to patch up what has been broken by appearing to be God's priest before the people. It's amazing the types of things that go on, particularly among preachers, when they put on their religious air and they attempt to pacify the people. Jeremiah talked about it, binding up a wound but not healing the wound. That's what we see here with Saul. It says that Samuel had appointed that time. We saw it already in 1 Samuel chapter 10, and verse 8 that he ordered Saul to wait there for Samuel. Here in verse nine, there are three things to underscore in this matter of looking to the Lord and being entirely cast upon the Lord and his mercies. The first is to wait on him. I know there are times when we wonder whether God is working or not. And we get to a point where we feel like we have to do something. We have to make something happen. That's the nature of our flesh. But the scriptures say to wait on the Lord. Again, I say wait. That was the great sin of Saul, not waiting. See, most people think, well, you can go out and commit adultery or you, you kill somebody, you steal. It takes nothing more than not waiting on the Lord. And if we're ever left to our own will, then we would face the same condemnation. I think of Adam and Eve back there in the garden, the very first sin. What did it take to cast an entire race, an entire world into condemnation? Adam and Eve didn't wait on the Lord. When Satan came and tempted them, the Lord had given them everything that they needed in that garden, but told them of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will not eat. They had the tree of life. What more did they need? And yet not waiting on the Lord, they looked at that tree of life and they saw that it was good to eat and they partook. The sin had already occurred in their heart, just in the looking. But secondly, waiting for the prophet of God to speak for God. Here, Samuel had told him in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 8, to go and to wait for him to come. Samuel would be the one to represent him before the Lord and to offer the sacrifices. He said, I will come down unto thee. And the same is true even in our own lives. When we're overwhelmed even with the consciousness of our own sin. And we endeavor attempt by 
devotional means, <laughs> means of devotion, religious works to somehow deal with what we're sensing in our own flesh, even our guiltiness before the Lord. What do we do? We wait on him who is God's prophet, priest, and king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe him, look to him, and not attempt to come to the Lord in any other way. We come as we are, as guilty and needy sinners. And then thirdly is to wait for that prophet priest to offer the Lord's sacrifice. That's the only hope for any of us. The greatest sin is to take matters in our own hands and not rest in that one sacrifice that God appointed and ordained for those sinners that he purposed to save, that of the Lord Jesus Christ, that by that one sacrifice, God has once for all sanctified, redeemed, justified, pardoned everyone that Christ came to save. What a glorious message. What a glorious savior. What a glorious sacrifice. And yet, no matter how much we know, of him and what this word says of him, how many times in our deepest need, when we're under the weight of even our own sin, that we think that somehow something we do or something that we act upon, that that's going to be what gives us peace other than the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And that's where Samuel asked Saul, what hast thou done? See, a lot of people that are running about today worshiping, they don't see the grave nature of their false worship because they're in unbelief. They're blind, they're deaf, they're dumb. But for Samuel, he asked, what hast thou done? And Saul knew. In fact, that's why it says there in verse 10 that Saul went out to meet him. <laughs> when I used to come home from a trip or something, if the kids ran out of the house and started quickly telling me the stories of what happened and, and why I should take their side and all that, I knew that they were justifying themselves. This is what Saul was doing. Sin never takes the blame nor does this natural heart, nor Satan. It's always putting the blame somewhere else or else justifying oneself. When Samus said, what hast thou done? It's just like our Lord in the garden there with Adam and Eve when he came to visit. Where art thou? And when they said they'd heard his voice and hid, well, who told you you were naked? These are things, again, that whenever that sin of not resting, not trusting, or taking matters into your own hand is manifest, all it can do is produce guilt and self-justify. And I want to say here that Saul, in justifying himself, said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me and that thou camest not within the days appointed." that the Philistines gather themselves together at Michmash, I can imagine him just going just as quickly in his self-justifying. Therefore said I. That's where people go awry. Well, I think you can never trust the I of self, self-will. That's why it's a fallacy even to think of so-called free will. It's not free, it's bound. Therefore said I. The Philistines will come down now upon me to, to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. It's like people today that they get themselves in trouble and they think, oh, I didn't have my devotions this morning. Or I guess I better get out my Bible and start reading and praying. But even worse, he said, therefore, when he, here he lied, I forced myself. Now he was thinking that somehow he could force God by doing what he did, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. There is no area, and I insist on this all the time in preaching, there's no area where the judgment of God is more severe 
That's why I've entitled this the greatest sin or the gravest sin. There's no area that is more severe and the wrath of God more certain than when men presume to be able to come to God in their own way and violating the sin offering and the sacrifice and the expiation for sin that is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Now, if we had time, we would go through many examples in the Old Testament. I'll just cite some of them here for us, and you can look these up and read them yourselves. Some of them you know. For example, of Cain. Remember, he came with the works of his hands there in Genesis 4, 3 through 5, and God disapproved. In fact, he told him, so long as you come that way, sin lies at the door. Go do that which is good, which means go get you a sacrifice like that of your brother Abel and bring it an offer. It's only through that sacrifice, that blood shed, that any can have remission of sin. Think about Nadab and Abihu, who were Aaron's sons, but they offered strange fire before the Lord. They got presumptuous and thought that they could come in any way. Numbers chapter 3 and verse 4, what happened? God slew him. Think of Moses. Yes, he was the Lord's, and yet when the Lord told him to speak to the rock, he'd already smitten it, and God had brought forth water. But now there in Numbers chapter 20, verses 9 through 11, when he, in his anger, smote the rock again, the Lord said for that he could not take the people of Israel into the promised land. What was the problem? Well, he violated a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his death, he was to be smitten one time. Think of Uzzah. Here again, David learned a hard lesson when they brought the Ark of the Covenant back from the Philistines. And rather than carry it on the shoulders of the priests as God had ordained, he put it on a brand new ox cart. And that according to the advice of his advisors. There's where we go wrong when we start asking around, well, what do you think? And while that ox cart was carrying that ark, the ox stumbled, the cart started to jiggle sideways and the ark of the covenant started to fall off the cart. And Uzzah, who was a priest, reached out his hand to stabilize it. It would have been better for that ark to fall on the ground than it would have been for Uzzah to touch it with his hand. And God slew it. They had music playing, everybody... It was a big old fanfare, and all of a sudden, all the music stopped. And David learned the lesson. In fact, when they finally got it again on the shoulders of the priest to carry it into Jerusalem, and that after some time, that every certain number of steps, they stopped and offered a sacrifice, stopped and offered a sacrifice. That's the gravest of sins. That's what Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6. The year that Uzziah the king died, I saw the Lord. What happened to Uzziah? He presumed that he could enter into that holiest of holies and lay his hand himself as the king upon the altar. And God smote him with leprosy. Oh, let us learn, dear friends, that there's no greater and graver sin than that to attempt to come unto God in any other way than through the Lord Jesus Christ and by is righteousness unto death, whereby God is just to justify. But here Samuel heard Saul coming, and this is what people will do. They'll even hear this message and they'll blow it off. They'll say, ah, oh, that may be so, but they go on justifying themselves and how they come. That's the pride of the human heart. And Samuel asked, what he had done, basically, his answer there in what we've just read could be broken down into four types of self-justification. First, he says, because I saw that the people were scattered from me. What was that? Well, he was losing the support of the people. They were leaving. For many that are preachers, that's all they're concerned about is making sure they gain and maintain their popularity and their Congregation, can't tell you how many have said, well, I see what 
the scriptures say, and I understand why it is that when you preach, you preach Christ and him crucified. But if I were to preach that message, my congregation, all the people would leave. Well, better they leave. And then he blames Samuel, secondly, by saying he didn't come when he, he thought he would. Samuel came exactly at the time appointed. People today on a whim will run on down the road to go hear another preacher because they can't find one that preaches the gospel. And so rather than stay at home and wait, and especially in our day with the internet, be able to sit down and in peace and quiet listen to a faithful gospel preacher, exalt Christ, they, they take matters into their own hands. Here is what Saul did, that thou camest not within the days appointed. And then thirdly, his self-justification were that the armies of the enemy were gathered together. <laughs> but what do you expect? Where God has his people in this world, there are going to be enemies that surround we're not to think that by looking to the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on Calvary and having that faith revealed in us that all is going to be beautiful days and cloudless skies and perfect weather and peaceableness. No, we're surrounded in a world of enemies. That's no reason then to go out and take matters in our own hands. But then fourthly, as I said, he turns to his own religiosity in self-justification. It's like people that go to pull out of their driveway and all of a sudden realize they got a flat tire and they go, oh, I didn't have my devotions this morning. Or they drive down the road and something else happens. Oh, I, I need to get back to having my daily devotions and praying. That's what Saul in verse 12, I have not made supplication on the Lord, so I force myself. Therefore, an offer to burn offer. I'll tell you what, there's only one offering that God ever accepts by which he ever blesses any of his own, and that's the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that was his greatest sin, and that's how he acted foolishly and proudly in acting himself, taking into his own hands as God's priest and offering a sacrifice rather than looking to Christ alone. In Hebrews chapter 10, let's close with this, Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 26, we're warned not to leave, not to deviate from this one good and just way that God has established. In verse 26, it says, for if we sin willfully, that's what Saul did, sinned willfully. After that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. He knew that that was not his role to offer that sacrifice. It says, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And go in another way. You go another way, there is no other sacrifice whereby you can find acceptance from God. It's only in, by, and through the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it's for our justification, our sanctification, our redemption, life itself, it's in the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Lord has so taught us of Christ, may he be pleased by his grace to keep us from that greatest and gravest sin that has condemned so many and yet the Lord's been merciful to such sinners as we are. And I thank him. Amen. <laughs>